Well, we have read through the um, portion of Scripture. Thank you, Pastor Justin, for um, reading through that this morning. So the title of the sermon this morning is Evidence of Our Encounter with God. Now, that can also be evidence of our encounters with God as well. Um, and um, in, in preparing this word, it's been a challenge to my own heart, um, and I hope it be a challenge to your heart, hearts as well. Genesis 32, in this portion of Scripture, and I just we started reading verse 24, but I just want to quickly read um, verse 22 and 23 as well, just to get a bit of context of uh, the, the, the message this morning. That night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, um, and you know who they were. They were Leah and Rachel. His two maidservants, these maidservants belonged to each one of these wives, um, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. And then the portion of Scripture obviously, that we had read. My sermon this morning is part of something which I preached in this church before, um, but I wanted to give some context to what I am wanting to relay to you um, this morning. Um, we have here a quick snapshot of the life of Jacob, and then uh, look at the application in our own lives. Every Bible portion comes with an application. It has to be, because that is our guide uh, and the lamp to our feet that the Bible sp speaks about. And uh, so I want to just place the narrative into a bit of context this morning um, and then present some points of impact um, and for us to just go away and think about uh, our own lives in this context. So for Jacob and for the rest of us, um, as we listen to God's word, uh, sin is a moral virus that wreaks havoc in the lives of people. I shared in the, just very briefly in the, in, in, in our, in the life group on Thursday that um, we, we, we assess God's word in terms of what it actually says, but when all the arguments are gone, we go back to the beginning, and it starts off with our fallen nature. And sin creates havoc in the lives of people. It makes us morally uh, corrupt, as is certainly in the, in the life of Jacob, within the portion that we've read, and if you take the context to the previous chapters, you will, um, of course, notice why. But God, in His faithfulness, continues to reverse the curse of sin, both here in the life of Jacob, and continues to reverse the curse of sin in the lives of people today. He is a faithful God. He steps forward all the time. He is faithful to His children. So, Jacob, after conning his brother Esau out of his birthright, with the help of his mother, whose name shall not be mentioned here this morning <laughs> to protect the innocent, um, he runs from Esau under the threat of death. We all know the story of where Jacob actually ended up um, and what he had to go through in the years following. Because in this story of the life of Jacob, the trickster was tricked very badly, Brother Sagun. He was tricked. He had his eye on Rachel, obviously, as the story goes, and uh, fell in love with her and, and, and went to her father to find out 
whether he could have a hand in marriage. And he said, yes, you can, but you need to work for me for seven years. That is kind of slavery to be working for seven years, looking after your father-in-law's sheep so that you can gain the hand of marriage um, of the one that you have your eye on. And then after the seven years at the time of his, of his intended marriage, he gets strict because his father-in-law couldn't get rid of one of his daughters, the elder one called Leah. And so we know the story. He woke up uh, the morning after they put a roofie in his, in his drink <laughs> and he fell asleep. And when he woke up the following morning, he looked across it in the words of one of the evangelists. He said, Lee, ah! <laughs> Found Leah alongside of him. And he knew that he was had. Okay? He had to try and make this right. And he went back to his father-in-law. And his father-in-law said, well, if you want Rachel, you need to work for me for another seven years. And he started all over again looking after the sheep, working for seven years, um, and plus another six years, so 20 years altogether, he worked for his father-in-law uh, until such time as he was released. So now 20 years later, God calls him back to the place where he started out. Um, he, he has on his way this angelic encounter, um, that we just read this morning. Um, and here I want to come to this verse of Scripture in Genesis 28, 15, where God says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. This should be a very familiar verse of Scripture to all of us here this morning because we are just passing through. For however long we are passing through, we are just passing through. We are sojourners uh, in this land. But God will keep you here and He will not leave you until He has done what He has promised um, you. You see, yet God hasn't forgotten He's promised to Jacob. He has made and passed on a, we heard this morning in the Bible study for you that, that, that were there, he, he passed on a covenant to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. That was that same promise and that same covenant that was running through um, their lives. And so 20 years later, after he's fled, Jacob um, gets the news that his brother Esau was on his way. He was coming to get him. He still had a very strong desire for revenge. So after 20 years, you would think that an issue in the lives of normal people would be resolved kind of would just fade into the background and, 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 and will be dealt with. But the question is today, how long can people hold grudges? How long is it possible for people to hold grudges? Well, it is as long as your memory would serve you. That is how long people can hold grudges. And so hearing of, of Esau's approach uh, with 400 armed men, a um, little army, Jacob steps into a very practical space um, right there and then. Uh, he took some practical steps to um, escape the, the conflict that was on its way, but also try and minimize the damage that he saw in his mind's eye. Was Jacob fearful? Yes, of course he was. He was fearful. Um, and so what did he do? He, he, he got into a situation, he divided his people and his possessions into, into two. 
because he worked out, Brother Pritham, that it's better to lose 50% of my stuff rather than lose everything. So I'm going to divide these people, uh, my possessions, into two and send them off into two different directions. He planned for a 50% loss. Our business people around here plan for 50% loss. So when we experience crisis in our lives, um, uh, a measure of common sense could prevail within our spirits. Um, it can help to minimize if we just sit down uh, instead of going into a flat panic when crisis hits. When we go into a flat panic when crisis hits, we do wrong, we, we do things that we shouldn't be doing. We take decisions that we should not be taking, but just stepping back and applying a little bit of common sense um, can save ourselves a, a lot of trouble. So, Jacob exposed his situation, calculated his risk, um, almost a just-in-case plan. But you see, we don't serve a just-in-case God. We don't serve a just-in-case God. We serve a God that always has a plan. He always has a plan, even in our worst times of crisis that we go through. And there are people here that can testify to the fact that crisis has hit them over the last two to three years, but God has a plan. And those who are traversing um, situations of crisis, I want to tell you this morning that God has a plan for your life. And He will take you through the times of crisis. Jacob was covered by the covenant that was cut between um, his father Abram and God. And that covenant is not just a legal contract, um, but it is God binding Himself to us in a relational way and promising to do us only good. That is the promise and the covenant that God cut with Abram. So the first point here is that we learn from God's character. And the only place that we learn from God's character that is out of God's word is where we learn from God's character. Um, so after he had calculated his risk and, 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 and decided what he was going to do, um, that night um, the word says that he took his family and his possessions and he sent them over the Jabbok, which, which was a little um, stream that they crossed. And he was left alone on his own, nothing there. And it was that night when he was alone that he wrestles with God in a very real way. Wrestling with God, brothers and sisters and friends, I want to say to you, should be an integral part of our personal lives when we enter into ministry. Wrestling with God should be an integral part of our lives when we in, enter into life of ministry within the church. And I'm talking about not what we have read in God's Word, uh, physical wrestling almost that Jacob was doing, but in our quiet times, together with the Lord, we need to be wrestling with God during that times. Because we're not engaging in a social level here. We're, in, we, we're doing His service. We're, doing, we're busy with kingdom business. And kingdom business has eternal value and kingdom business has eternal consequences. And we need to wrestle through situations in our own life. Secondly, there's a significance of the name change, Jacob. So after wrestling with God, the Bible says, all night through, Jacob was asked to give his name. The person that he was wrestling with asked him for his name. So now that 
may have been a little bit uncomfortable for Jacob. Why? Because it was there in the meaning of his name. His name actually meant cheater and deceiver. That was the meaning of his name. And here God asks him for his name. So you can imagine how uncomfortable that might have made Jacob because he knew what the meaning of his name was. And giving his name would remind him of that reality. So just imagine for a moment the Lord confronts each and every one of us and asks us what our name is. Not that your name would mean anything like the name of Jacob, but I've had people that came up to me and said, we didn't like your emphasis because the gentleman said to me, my surname is Jacob's. I said, I merely preach the word of God. I, you know, you make of your name what you want to, brother. Um, but, um, but if God asks you your name, I'm speaking about pointing out in your name what your character looks like in the eyes of God. Um, does it raise dishonor? Does it raise shame as to where you are in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or your relationship with God? What does it do if you are asked um, your name? But does your name reflect that you have had a personal encounter with God? Does your name present evidence that you have had an encounter with God? Now God does those things. He asks what's your name? Go back to the Garden of Eden with me and after Adam and Eve had done what they did, what did God say? Adam, where are you? Assuming that God didn't know where they were. But God was saying, Adam, what have you done? Where are you at with your relationship with me? Where are you? God asks those questions that we think, are you hiding from me? No. Where are you? What is your name? There's a kind of a deeper meaning on the play of those words that sometimes um, we don't understand. Does it reflect that I have had a personal encounter with God? And so Jacob was renamed Israel. Jacob is renamed Israel so that his life would be a testimony to the fact that God rules. That name changes in the favor of what God had for his life. It reflected that actually God had the final say in the treacherous and conniving ways that Jacob presented when he conned his brother out of his birthright. That all changed because he was renamed Israel. His life was supposed to reflect that he had an encounter with God. And the physical evidence was there anyway, because the Bible says that after wrestling the whole night, I, I have this picture in my mind that eventually when the sun rose, that Jacob was no longer wrestling physically with God. He was just holding on for dear life, because he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. That is a major thing in terms of how we wrestle with God and are we able to say, I will not depart from your presence until I sense that you have blessed me. We heard last night about us uh, looking into the future and personalizing how faithful we would become in ministry and in our service to the Lord. I will not let you go I will not leave your presence until you have blessed me. And the evidence would be there when God blesses you because he walked away 
limping because God touched the socket of his hip. You see, when, when we have an encounter with God, I want to say to you this morning that, that the evidence is left behind. Jacob was left with a limp as he looked at his encounter with God. Moses' face shone as he reflected God's glory after he was in God's presence. Elijah, after he had been in God's presence, was able to go and anoint his successor. Thomas had a special encounter. <coughs> Excuse me. Because when he stood face to face with the Lord and he put his finger in the holes and in the side, all that he could exclaim is my Lord and my God. He had that special encounter with the Lord at that point. I took a brief look at a few hymns of the ages that we sang so lustily uh, before. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. O oh love, that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee, I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown these hymns, were evidence that these men and women was in the presence of Almighty God and they had an experience that left that evidence behind. My late dad, armed with his accordions after he came to salvation, a little while later, sat on the couch and he'd love to sing uh, what we called choruses in those days. <coughs> Sorry, we didn't call it praise songs. We called it choruses. And so he would sit and play and he, and, and he would sing this old chorus that probably predates us in our age. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home for there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven never more to roam. And I tell you, my dad owned that song. My mom was busy in the kitchen cooking and he sang his heart out. Uh, we, we didn't come to salvation. Uh, you know, we would hear my dad sing and, and the accordion he played, you know, I kind of, I hope this thing gets a puncture somewhere along the line, um, you know, which it did eventually, and he couldn't fix it anymore. So we had a bit of peace, but he still sang a cappella. Um, yeah, those chorus is never going to get away from that. But he had his encounter with God, and the evidence was right there. I don't suppose this morning that after being in God's presence we would leave this place with a limp. But I would expect that we would leave here having had an intimate encounter with the Lord. An intimate encounter with the Word of the Lord and with the Lord of the Word on a personal level. And the evidence would be there that something wonderful and something glorious has happened when we leave this place. Lastly, we look at the outcomes of God's work in our own lives. Jacob was a schemer. Okay? He was a schemer. And he made necessary plans for meeting with his brother Esau. That had all worked out. Sometimes... People do that to protect themselves. Sometimes in the church of God, people do that 
to protect themselves. We don't need schemers in the church. Um, we don't have schemers in this church. Uh, I've never found that, Pastor Justin. You know, uh, we don't. But we don't need that kind of attitudes in the church of God. We need men and women who will humble themselves before the Lord and allow Him to exercise His sovereign and His supreme will in their lives. That is the kind of men and women that the church of God needs in order to grow and impact and affect people that they come into contact with. And if you are wrestling with God so that you can win, I have bad news for you, my friend. You will never win. Jacob didn't win. Jacob lost the wrestling match. I think in the reading of God's word, we all suppose that God gave up. God didn't lose that wrestling match. And Jacob didn't win. But Jacob's losing resulted in him receiving a new name. So his loss was ultimately his gain. He stepped away from that name that meant cheater and deceiver to a new name that could connect with the God that he served. So you see, um, when you go back to the experience of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as he, as he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane, he also wrestled. He wrestled with the fact that he saw what was going to happen to him, the gruesomeness of his experience of his pre-crucifixion and then being nailed to the cross, and he wrestled with that. He prayed for each and every one of us. The Bible says that um, anxiety uh, overtook him uh, so intensely that it was like sweat drops of blood that oozed from his brow. He wrestled that day. Yet he said, not your will, not my will be done, but your will in my own life. That is a very intense thing to us, to, for us to get into. So you see, that day around the cross, beside those that were standing there, Jesus' mother, the disciple that he loved, and one or two others, most of the crowd looked at the cross, saw Jesus' limp body hanging there, and thought to themselves, he has lost. He has lost. Sadly, ultimately, this years of ministry ended up with him hanging on a Roman cross. But the Bible says that he rose again in victory on the third day to become our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose, the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose and that is why we can have that connect with Jesus Christ that sometimes we are so afraid of because we don't know what our future with Him will, will, will hold. But I want to say to you, a future in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, where He takes you through, you will go from strength to strength. You do not need to fear. You do not need to be afraid. You will be aligned to the future that we've heard last night, uh, unafraid, stepping out boldly because we know that our captain will not lead us along unfamiliar pathways, but he will take us where he destined us to be. Let me close with this little saying of Charles Haddon Spurgeon when he says, Dear friends, I'm afraid that the lives of many of the Lord's chosen people alternate between Israel and Jacob. Like princes, we prevail with God and we are true Israels, but perhaps ere the sun has gone down, we limp 
with Jacob. And though the spirit be willing, the flesh is weak. We are Jacob before we are Israel. And we are Jacob when we are Israel. But blessed be to God, we are Israel's with God when we cease to be Jacob's among men. We are Israel's with God when we cease to be Jacob's among men. What Spurgeon is saying here is if God has changed your name, He has also changed the relationship that He now has with you, and you don't need to become Jacob at certain times of your life, and when you're in the presence of God, then you are Israel. He's saying when God changes your name, then you are Israel in His presence. Our struggles should bring us closer to God, and as we encounter Christ in a personal way, we too will be changed. We too will present the evidence that we've been in God's presence. We too will be confident in the midst of crisis, and there will be a distinct evidence that we have wrestled with God. We have held on to Him and we've said to Him, Lord, I am determined. I will not let you go until you bless me. And if that is the call upon your spirit, you will leave this place. In the next weeks, there will be evidence that you have been in a serious wrestling with the Lord. And that evidence will follow you in your lives. Let us pray together. I want to give you this opportunity this morning. You have a sense that the Lord has spoken to your life. And you are saying, I want to get myself to a point where I just want to cross the Jabbok. I just want to cross the stream. I want to walk away after my, after my encounter with God and know that I'm in the road that the Lord wants me to be. I'm going to do nothing else this morning but to ask you to stand in your place um, and have a quick conversation with the Lord. And then I will pray. It was ask the Lord to just give you that strength. The Lord has spoken to you and you wish to do that this morning. You just want to stand in your seat where you are. Um, and you just speak to the Lord quietly this morning. And then I will pray. Is there anybody that the Lord has spoken to this morning? Thank you. At the back, anyone else? Thank you very much. Anyone else? You just want to stand this morning and say to the Lord, um, thank you, um, that um, I want to be where you want me to be. Anyone else before I pray? Thank you over here. Thank you at the back there. Anyone else? We quietly wait on the Lord and, and you say to the Lord, I need, I need a breakthrough in my own life. Won't you just walk a road with me? Won't you just bless me where I am? Father God, we thank you so much that your word is living and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, it cuts asunder uh, anything that we would hide in our own spirits. And I bless you this, this morning, O oh Lord, for your word. Uh, it is all powerful. Lord, uh, you live within your word, and that is what we present. And I pray for these uh, dear ones that are standing here this morning, uh, just as an indication to you that 
uh, we want to walk this road knowing that we can openly show the evidence that we have had our encounter with God and we have encounters with God on a daily basis. And our lives and our characters and our behaviors show who we are and whose we are. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.